the scientist holds to a fundamental faith that there is unity in nature. On that faith, he can make elegant rules to describe the things he has observed and to predict things that have yet to be observed. Waves occur around us in endless profusion. In fact, anything that has motion can be thought of in terms of waves. We have developed considerable knowledge about sound waves and electromagnetic waves. Much use has been made of this knowledge. Additional applications of our knowledge of electromagnetic radiation have been made possible by the invention of the laser. With this source of pure light waves, theories and formulae developed by many people over hundreds of years could now be applied in a dramatic new science of coherent optics. Actually, uh, the theory of holography was uh, developed a long ago, in 1947, in fact by Professor Dennis Cabot of uh, the Imperial College of England. But uh, since that time, uh, at that time, there was no laser. So he was not able to make the holograms as, as you see them today. But since the development of the laser in the 1960s, uh, Professor Leith and Upetniak in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor has added their own ideas into it and using laser light have gotten holography to the present stage. And now, of course, uh, lots of people around the world are working on holography, and not just myself, around here. 30 miles north of Chicago, the tree-shaded campus of Lake Forest College rests near the shore of Lake Michigan. The summer student population is small, and the breeze from the lake makes the campus a pleasant place. There are also outside groups that use its facilities. The primary activity of Lake Forest is always the pursuit of knowledge. last few days we've been studying the general phenomena of waves. Now today we are going to come down to the brass tacks of talking about the particular subject of holography. Now we are going to do this by demonstrating to you in three different ways using water waves, sound waves and then finally light waves. In each case we'll try to find out what happens when two beams of light, or of any kind of waves, meet one another on a given uh, plane of space. And we'll find how, because of their so-called interference pattern, we are going to be able to record and finally reproduce the original situation. First, we are going to show you something that you know very well, actually the phenomenon involving water waves. What happens when one sort of wave interacts with another? The interaction of two-dimensional waves can be studied by a simple device called a ripple tank. Two wave sources are obtained from a single vibrator. These waves are coherent because they are moving up and down together at the same frequency. A strobe light projects the shadow of the wave action. 
where coherent waves interfere with each other, a fixed pattern is formed. It is on this principle, the formation of a stationary pattern by the interference of coherent waves, that holography is based. Now, in the first slide here, we simulate a single source of disturbance. For example, if you bob something up and down on water, you would create a set of waves emanating from that source, equally distant. Now, if I take another source of disturbance and put it next to the first, and also synchronously bob it up and down with the first source, you see something strange happens. And depending on the location of the two sources, we can have this pattern changing from very fine to very coarse. Along this line, the light is coming through both sets of rings, which we can say uh, exemplify a constructive interference. That is, both water waves are going up and down together, resulting in a very violent motion. Here, along this line, there's no light coming through. We can say that this represents a destructive interference. That is, the two sets of waves are going up and down exactly in opposite directions, so that along this line there will never be waves in spite of the fact that two sources of waves are always moving out. So that whatever the source is, depending on how they are located, there will always be a set pattern of interference in space as so long as the two sources are coherent. Coherent sound waves can be produced from two speakers driven by a single oscillator. By using a microphone and an oscilloscope, we can detect the interference pattern of the sound waves. The interference pattern on a plane intersecting the three-dimensional sound waves looks like this. Note, these are parallel lines, while two-dimensional lines radiate. Haven't seen how water waves and sound waves behave in space. We are now going to use a helium neon laser to show how coherent light behaves. This laser gives off a beam of red light at 6,328 angstroms, a very pure red. And I'm going to make this single beam into two by having a half silver surface here, so that half of the light is transmitted and the other half is reflected. And by a combination of two little mirrors, I have projected two beams of light from the same laser on the screen. This, of course, is the same as having two speakers being driven by the same oscillator. With ordinary light, when you merge two beams of light together on a screen, you would get a spot that is twice as bright, but no modulation. But when I use coherent light and merge them together, you notice something by now perhaps familiar happens. They interfere precisely in the same way as the water wave or the sound wave. Along the dark lines, that's where the destructive interference appear. That is, that's when one light beam having a wave vector going in one direction and the other one going in exactly the opposite direction so that they are canceling out each other. But adjacent to those lines, they are reinforcing one another, causing a constructive interference. So that this pattern here is similar to the sound pattern, for example, because in that case, we also have two speakers driven by the same oscillator. And as you see, all waves, if they're coherent, will behave in a similar manner. And this pattern here contains information now, because there's only one way in which you can shine two beams of light together on that plane that gives that particular pattern. We can put a piece of film in the location of that interference pattern and expose it and then process it. What we have now is called a grading. In other words, a pattern of straight lines. Now, to remind you, we form this pattern by two beams, one from here and one from this location onto the film. Now, by projecting one beam alone backwards through it, we get the other beam reconstructed. So in a sense, this is the simplest kind of hologram, a hologram of one beam of light. 
Suppose now, instead of having one beam coming from this direction, we have two. So both will interfere with that beam simultaneously. And if we now put a piece of film at that location, we have captured the sum of two sets of uh, gratings. And of course, if I project the reference beam back toward it, we of course get the reconstruction of both beams. So that this operation is a symmetrical one. Here we combine two beams together and form a pattern which we call it, this geometry. And then later, by projecting this one beam back through it, we get the object beam we created. Now, understanding this part alone will enable us to understand holography in general. Because in effect, uh, this is the simplest kind of hologram. It's a way of recording a beam of light in direction and intensity and so forth. Now, suppose we go one step further, and instead of shining one single beam of light and interfere it with another beam, we are going to put an object, a general three-dimensional object, directly in front of the photographic plate. Notice the difference here uh, from photography. We have no lens or any kind of imaging system between the film and the object. Well, in a way, if photography has not been invented, it should have been invented this way. That takes care of the camera. Now, let's consider two typical points on an object. When you light this object up with laser light, like this, each point will reflect or scatter light. And most of it will fall all over the photographic plate. Now, if we take one of them alone and interfere it with a reference beam like this, what we have, of course, a relatively simple pattern form, as I have shown a while ago. But since every point of this object is illuminated, the film would add together all the different simple patterns together, forming a very complex pattern. So that if you take this piece of film now and process it, and look through this plate, you will see nothing intelligible, because this is not an image forming system. You will see only complex lines and dots and so forth. If now we take this piece of film and shine the reference beam to it, then simultaneously, each set of simple patterns formed by each point of light with the reference will be recreated. Take this point. That the pattern caused by this point of light with this beam will now scatter light in such a way that it recreates that point. Light will come in this direction as if there were a light source there. And similarly, every other point will do the same. In effect, since the film captures all the patterns for every point simultaneously, it now recreates all the light from every point simultaneously. So that if each of these points on the subject is performing this superposition of complex patterns, then by shining this reference beam backwards, back on the plate, we are recreating every point on the object. And if you are viewing this hologram from this side, you will see everything that you would see in this situation, as if the object were there. So that on that side of the universe, physically, everything is the same as if the object were there. So you are, in effect, recreating both the amplitude and the phase of light from the object. Now this represents the simplest way of making a hologram. We can split the illuminating beam into any number of beams you wish. So that we can direct light from any direction and light up the object as artistically as you wish. As you can see, the rest is art. What are the characteristics of a holographic image? It can be viewed as a three-dimensional object in space. It can be projected on a screen Notice how the narrow beam of light 
finds an image anywhere on the plate. It is the equivalent of looking at a scene through a window. How easily apparent the three-dimensional quality. Holograms can be made with any color the laser can generate. Here, the magnifying glass in the hologram actually magnifies. This holographic image projected on a cinder block wall still keeps its three-dimensional integrity because we see it from the perspective of wherever the narrow beam penetrates the plate. An abstract multicolor holographic image. The white light from a Krypton laser produces the four sets of colored spheres. By surrounding an object with a strip of film, a cylindrical hologram can be made. Well, here's an example of multiplexing in holography. It means you can have more than one scene recorded all over the same piece of film and each scene making the same angle with respect to the reference beam. For example, if you look down at it, from this side you see one object, and on that side you see a completely different object, both making the same angle with the reference beam, you see? This is the same as radio. When you tune into a multiplex radio, you hear two channels of music on the same frequency band. This is known as the virtual image you're looking at. Now, I can project this on a screen also. For example, you see the same two scenes, the real image of which is projected, you see? Now, notice again, they are making the same angle with the reference beam. Now, notice all the empty space around here. I could have put different scenes all along this circle within the same channel. In fact, I could even go into multi-channeling like radio does and go into a different circle and put even more stations on it. So you can see that uh, holography has a great future, perhaps in the high storage capacity of information. Now, other than uh, the high storage capacity, it has other advantages too. For example, the non-destructibility. If this were microfilm and I kind of scratch it up, it's ruined, right? But for hologram, We can break it into pieces. And if we take up a piece, for example, I'll take one from this corner and project it through this beam of light, we'll see two images. <laughs> see? So I could have taken any piece and I got still the information. So it's practically indestructible. I could divide it into another two halves and I would still be able to uh, get the two scenes on the screen. And of course, as it gets smaller and smaller, I can no longer get any light through it. That's the limit. But uh, scientists have been able to put a thousand different pictures on a single cube of holographic medium. And it's kind of interesting to think that uh, if you, it happened to be an encyclopedia that is recorded, and you sort of dropped it and it's shattered into four, you would then have four sets of encyclopedia. Now, not only that, uh, any little piece, if I put back up here, if I expand the beam again, now you can look through and take any chip and see everything still there. There are two, one scene and the other scene, you see? This is similar to a window through which you are looking at a scene out there. I can shut both windows and peep through a keyhole and see everything, you see? But to the limit that the keyhole gets smaller and smaller, uh, not enough light's going to come through. So we have only that kind of limitation. Additional images may also be obtained by using the Venetian blind effect of a thick photographic emulsion.
There is much more to laser holography than the reproduction of images. There is much more to this magic window through which we can see a universe that hangs in the air. It is a gigantic thrust into the future, a tool to find the answers to questions yet to be asked. Holographic interferometry. After exposing the object, apply a slight pressure. Expose the object again on the same film. Develop the film. All parts that have moved, even microscopically, will reveal their movement by creating interference patterns. The interference lines can show up defects without damage to the object. The shifting pressure lines projected on a flat surface attest to the three-dimensionality of the projected information. The principle of holographic interferometry is applicable to living things. Here, the growth of a living cell. This can be applied to microscopic objects, opening up a vast field of research in medicine. Real-time holographic interferometry. By placing the developed holographic plate in its original relationship to the object, any movement of the object viewed through the plate causes interference lines. In this same way, the actual growth of a living cell can be viewed in minute detail. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Is this a good field to go into? Well, Joan, uh, you know, if I were a student today, I would consider this seriously because although this is a very new field, but uh, so many advanced techniques has been developed over these past few years that it has become an answer looking for the question. That is, we know a, a lot about holography, actually, but it's what to do with it that has become the problem itself. So uh, right now, there are many people all over the world who are working in this field, using holography for data storage, for uh, using it to mass produce electronic parts, to do stress analysis, to study medicine. So it's opening a new frontier. So that I would say yes yeah, to your question. Downey, Illinois Veterans Administration Hospital is five miles north of Lake Forest. One of a system of more than 160 hospitals dedicated to the care of veterans. Part of this care involves an active research program. This is Dr. Suknandan giving a brief account of the future usefulness of holography in medicine and allied sciences, period. Holography presents a relatively new but promising and useful tool for diagnostic procedures as well as research projects along the lines of tissue culture and growth patterns of microorganisms. The internal organ of the body is tremendous. Merely the idea of studying dendritic processes of the basic nerve cells opens up a new dimension in the entire field of mental retardation. The concept of developing a holographic time-lapse movie to study normal and as much as holography is still in the stage of infancy, comma, it presents many future promises of an invaluable diagnostic tool, not only in the field of pathology, but other aspects of medicine, period. This concludes this dictation. Thank you. Dr. Shaw? Uh, um, 
As you can see, the front face of the pressure cell cracked. Well, did it work, Doc? Yes, it did. Made a hologram in under 30 seconds. Well, that's great, Doc. It's much better to see it uh, crack and work than to see it intact and not work, yeah. you know. 30 seconds, yeah. Real time, Francis. Well, you know why it's cracked. It's square. If you yeah. had made it round, the stress lines would have been uh, more symmetrical and it wouldn't have... Well, it's, I'd like to see you try it again right okay. away. Okay. All right? Okay. Well, you know, this is the way science goes. Even as we're making a movie, some progress is being made. And I think making a real-time hologram within seconds is uh, a straightforward. I'm sure that uh, by the time you see this movie, other researchers will have uh, come up with even better ideas than this. But this is the excitement of science, and that's how our technology marches on. So, for the scientist, holography is part of a continuity that runs from the past to the future. He knows much of what holography can accomplish must be left to the future. And he knows it is left in capable hands.